Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Um, how are people today? Good. End of the week. Um, I guess that could be good. Could be good or bad. So um, I'm glad to see that so many people are doing are doing well. I hope I hope that continues. Um, we're about done with the tenth week of the semester. Um, I think it's probably been it's probably been a challenge. I think you know Zoom is it's not so easy to um, it's, a, it's a challenge I guess when you're taking courses. But I hope you know that there's sort of a light at the end of the tunnel, um, so to speak. That in a few weeks um, your work will be done. The, uh, the course, I guess, is proceeding along a um, pretty good timeline. I guess I'll make some administrative announcements, which um, are, which is, I guess, our custom. But um, a couple things this week. Um, remember that exam two, um, this is the exam period for exam two. So make sure that, um, you know, make sure that you attend to that. Um, the exam ends in, in, in a, uh, the exam period ends at 11.59 tomorrow night. So if you haven't taken it, it's, it's not a big deal, um, you know, as long as you take it by, um, by tomorrow night at some point. Um, give yourself an hour and a half, a couple hours just to sort of prepare, to think about it, to give yourself enough time to sort of process, um, to process the exam. A few people have already taken it, um, uh, not, not everyone for sure, maybe, maybe about uh, a fourth of the class is already in, maybe, or around a fifth maybe. So, you know, continue to do, um, you know, continue to look at the material to review it, do what you did to prepare for the first exam. I think that actually for, for the class generally went pretty well. So whatever you did for the first exam, just see if you can repeat that, review the homework that you've done, make a set of notes. Um, then when you think you're ready, take the test either today or tomorrow. Um, reading assignment 17, the reading assignment, which occurs the reading, the, which the reading assignment, which supports um, the work that we're talking about right now when we're talking about confidence intervals and sampling distributions for the sample mean. Um, that one is due this Friday, um, so make sure for that. You don't really have to um, answer any questions which are specific to that assignment, but it's a lot like the reading assignments for last, for last week. What I'm hoping is that, you know, people sort of hold on to the reading assignments and they can view these as summaries. So if you want to go back and think about what you did in chapter 16 and 17, but you don't want to, you know, read through the entire uh, the, the entire collection of chapters, you can go back and look at the summaries. Um, but I guess for the purpose of the reading assignment, ideally what would happen is you read through it, um, you read through the reading assignment itself, you read through chapter 17, you read through the reading assignment itself, and you, you know, build a couple of questions, two or three questions that you feel like you might want to get answered. Um, I'm hoping that someone along the way asked me a particular question, which I'll, which I'll talk a little about today, um, maybe so you don't have to, don't have to ask it, but you may still want to ask it anyway. Um, the homework on my stat lab, which supports chapter 17, is due this Monday at 5 p.m. Um, there was no reading, there was no written assignment that was assigned this week, so nothing like that is due on Tuesday. Probably, I think at this point, you will have turned in six written assignments. I really only have in mind to assign a couple of more. Um, so there'll be there'll be seven and eight. Um, I was thinking about nine, but you know, I might I might not want to do that and just give people that last week off before final exam. Yes, Lily. So I have a question about the reading assignment. So it's uploaded as a PDF. Yeah. Um, do you just want us to down, like, how do you want us to submit that? Like, do we download it and figure out a way to write it on it? No, you don't have, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to resubmit the PDF. Um, oh, okay. So I think, I think on Blackboard, you, you would be able to download the reading assignment as a PDF if you wanted to go back and review it at some point, or you can save it on your computer, but you, you don't have to take the PDF and then you don't have to take the PDF and then figure out how to use Adobe to like write on it or something. You know, that, that's sort of a, I don't want to mess with that. Um, just, just read it, um, compose some notes either. I think you can type in the questions directly in the Blackboard as a submission. So that's a possibility. A another possibility is just to create a Word document and just list the questions and submit that. That would be fine as well. So either way, but you don't, you don't, don't think that you have to take the entire, the entire document, download it, figure out how to type in questions into it. I mean, you can if you want to, but um, to be honest, when I'm looking for questions in that, in that situation, it's sort of difficult to find in the document because they're not, it's not really annotated. So if you do, if you do turn in the, the PDF, you probably want to have the questions like at the end or something like that. 
but if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You know, I know, I know what's, I know what's in the summary. So it's, it's just more of a matter of, well, okay, look, I've read it, read the chapter. Here are some things that, that I'd like to talk about and um, just type those in if you want. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, right. So are there any, are there, are there any other, any other questions that people might have? Um, we're sort of, it's odd to say this, but at the end of week 10, effectively we have weeks 11, 12, and 13 where new material will be presented that might spill over into week 14 or it might not. Um, after week 14, you have final exam week and that's kind of the end. So we're sort of closing in on the end of the course. I think it's gone pretty well actually. So people should feel pretty good about what they've done. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep sort of assigning things, keep doing the homework and turning these things in on time as best you can. Um, so I don't, I don't see, you know, for people I don't see um, a need for a major course correction um, right now. So things are fine. We're proceeding according to schedule. Um, in fact, we may get a little ahead of it today, which, which I think is all right. Um, so I'd like to talk uh, a little about the new material. Um, you, you've already done, I don't wanna talk for too long. Um, I put another document up on Blackboard, so I'll kind of show you where that is. Um, it's related to new material, but the first question I wanna ask about it is not related to the new material. Um, so I wanna sort of summarize kind of where we're at from last week and this week, because I think there are a lot of things that we said last week that have some things in common with what we're seeing this week. Um, and I wanna point out, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the author's treatment of the subject, and I think this is kind of common in all treatments of, of the subject, there's, there's, a bit of a, there's a bit of a question that you should have um, coming from chapter 16 after having read 17. Um, so just to kind of summarize, you know, where we're at. So I think in reading through people's questions about the, the 16, the chapter 16 reading, reading assignment. Um, remember the goal is, uh, the goal of chapter 16, and for that matter, chapter 17, is to just, is to estimate the value of a population parameter. A population parameter is a number, though you don't know what it is. Um, over those two chapters, um, the two parameters that we're basically after are, are these two. Um, the population proportion, um, so we have a few examples of that, and that's denoted with the symbol P. And in chapter 17, the population mean, which is denoted with the symbol mu. So if you're, if you're thinking about the population mean, you tend to be worried about numerical measurements. So you're dealing with quantitative things, things that you can average. If you're talking about the population proportion, you tend to be more interested in a question of counts. So as a total of the entire population, what percentage of the population has some characteristic of interest? So when you're thinking about say polling in advance of an election of some kind, you tend to be interested in something that looks like this. Um, when you're looking at say, um, so that's just an example. That's almost an example. We'll talk more, a little bit more about that um, in the coming week or two. Um, if you're thinking about the population mean, the type of question that you tend to be interested in are things like, you know, some facts, questions about mean, income, or, or something like this. So, you know, things that quantitative variables versus counts. So it's, it's, it's in a way with proportions, it's inference for something that's categorical in a way. For, for mean, it's inference over things which are, um, numerical, which are quantitative. Now, you know, in this environment, it turns out that, you know, what we have to say about these two things is pretty similar. So what we have to say about these things, it's similar, at least so far. Um, not, not that different, it's pretty easy to get confused actually. So for estimation, Of, of the population proportion, um, we generally look to see um, whether or not whether or not some conditions are met. Now you can read um, a bit about that a bit about that in the book, but there's typically some notion of the randomness. Um, and independence conditions. So it sort of folds into one. 
Um, when you're talking about the randomness condition, I mean, the, the question is, if you're looking at something, do you think that you're, you're drawing the information from a simple random sample? If you're looking at something coming from an experiment, do you feel like the treatment groups have been randomly assigned? And so often when you're thinking about a condition like this, it involves sort of looking into what people actually did. So um, if people go out, I mean, for example, an, a non-example of such a thing is suppose that you're interested in the proportion of students, um, or you're interested in the proportion of students that, uh, uh, the proportion of AU students that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe own their own car or something like this. Um, you go out on the, I mean, you can't really do this now because no, no, not very many people are on campus, but when people return to campus, I guess conceivably what you could do is you could go out to um, the, the quad and ask the first 100 people that you happen to run across at eight in the morning. Now, the, the thing is that that's not really a random sample because I mean, there's certainly some things which might affect, you know, your, your work there. The fact that it's at 8 a.m. is important, um, for example. Um, the fact that you're, you're only getting people that are walking around the quad, and you don't deal with people that are off campus, which might, might be important to answering the question. So that kind of thing is a worry sometimes. And if, if, the if, if it's not random, the damage that that does to the work might be so significant that the methods might not even be applicable at all, that, that you're, you might not be dealing with a mathematical um, sort of remediation. And with independence, you're sort of looking at, you know, whether or not, you know, things within the sample affect other things. So you know, is it plausible that um, if you ask a group of people, do you think the answers within the group will affect other people's answers within the same group if you run into three people at the same time and ask them all this question? And so, you know, when you're when you're looking at that condition, it's mostly about do you think that was do you do you think that the experiment or the survey was done in such a way so that you know you're dealing with something that's either not a simple random sample or that there's some interrelationship between elements of the sample you know you're worried about that because if things like that occur it could really impeach what follows um you're also generally worried about the so-called 10 percent condition um you know this is less of a worry because um it, it if you if you get ha if you happen to have a population that's small and you you take a sample that's like half of the size of the population it's actually not a bad thing to do. It, it, it's just that the methods that we're talking about don't apply. You're less worried about this probably than any other condition because what's gonna happen if you use the techniques but this is somehow violated, you're probably gonna wind up with a wider estimate that's actually necessary. So the techniques that you tend to learn in, 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 in 202 are small data techniques in the sense that um, you have a small sample relative to the total population size but you're still making inferences about the population. When you get over 10%, in many ways, it's actually better. Um, it's just that the techniques we're talking about don't quite work in that environment the way that you would expect. Um, and finally, there's this, like if you're dealing with proportions, there's this, there's this last condition, um, and it's somewhat mysteriously called the success failure condition, which, which has to do, in effect, with the number of successes or failures that you expect in any sample. Um, so you want NP to be greater than 10, and also n times one minus p to be greater than ten. Um, practically, you know, you're generally looking at, you know, whether or not it's plausible that this condition is satisfied. So you generally check something like that, where p hat represents the sample proportion that you wind up getting as a result of something that you do. Um, so if all of these are, are satisfied when you're trying to estimate something about p, then you feel like. Um, the distribution of p hat, the sampling distribution, is normally distributed with mean p in standard deviation p times 1 minus p over n. Um, so what we're saying is that the picture of p hat looks a little like that. Now, one thing that I think cannot be overstated in a course like this, I guess overstated is the right, or stated too many times in a course like this, is that the, the sampling distribution um, in a course like this is the technical tool that makes everything go. And that's also kind of true for subsequent classes that you might take in this direction. Um, it's, it's the key tool in this line of inquiry. So um, you could be talking about what we're gonna be talking about this week or next, or even in some other classes that are, that are stat courses sort of at the level of stat 302 or 320 or some other course, but it's the sampling distribution that matters. Um, the, only, the only time where you feel like that plays less of a role is if you're consciously trying to think about these things in another way. Um, another sort of major school of thought 
Another major line of inquiry is this Bayesian approach, in which case, in, in, in that case, the sampling distribution doesn't really play this role, something else does. Um, and you know, the, uh, the underlying belief that we have in the course is that there are actually parameters to estimate that you're dealing with a number of some kind, whether that in this case is either a proportion or a mean. So this is the sampling distribution for PHAD. It's normally distributed. It's got some characteristics that you can talk about um, from, let's say a practical standpoint. You don't really know, you don't know P. So um, when you're trying to cook up, you know, a formula for The, con the, the family of confidence intervals, um, you typically use the margin of error equal to some critical number called, Z, it just is labeled, it's labeled C star times um, something that looks like this. Um, and, you know, what I would say though, right, just as a parenthetical, after reading chapter 17, this should bother you. Um, so I'll try to talk about that a, a bit a bit later. So before I go on, um, you know, we, you've done a number of problems. Um, you've had a chance to maybe mess with the homework a bit. So does, does anyone have any questions so far about the line of inquiry, the line of conversation? Again, the fundamental, the fundamental tool is the sampling distribution. And if certain conditions are satisfied, we're going to treat the sampling distribution for P hat as it varies across all possible random samples of a fixed size as being something that's normally distributed. If some of those conditions aren't met, then you can't really use the techniques. Yes, Danielle. I just have a quick question. Um, do you mind going back to that last slide really quick? I do not mind. Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, where was, where was your question? Sorry, my question was, do you mind going back to the last oh, slide? Oh, okay, so I thought- I'm you, sorry. So you, so you don't have a question about what's on, on the page. It's just- no. uh, yeah, I just didn't uh, finish writing all of it down. Yeah, Thank all right, that's fair. Um, one more thing that I would note, um, not, not a parenthetical, but you know, practically, um, the critical number Z star is, uh, or rather I should say corresponds to confidence level. Um, and so, you know, for various, for various confidence levels, you get different values of Z star and you use the standard normal distribution to come up with these. And so, um, you know, I won't really write very much more about that, but I feel, I feel like people have done this. They get some sense about how to do the estimate. Um, when you see a formula that looks a bit like this, um, what, what you're describing is, is basically not one interval. Um, if I'd like people to think of this, not really as like, look, I'm just after a single interval. I mean, often that's, that's how you do problems, but Think about that formula as representing an infinite number of intervals, one for each random sample that you that you, you could get out of a population. So if I take a random sample from a, of 100 people from some population and you take a random sample of 100 people from the same population, we're liable to get different answers for P hat. And if you think about this for a minute, and this is related to the parenthetical, if we get different answers for P hat, then the center of our intervals will be different but in fact, so will the margin of error. And so um, when you're thinking about the formula that the author wants to use to come up with these, with these confidence intervals, it's as though two things are varying at the same time. Now, if you just read chapter 16, um, this doesn't bother you that much. It, it seems like, well, sure, why not? P hat's probably close to P. So you, you figure that going back to, um, you know, going back to something like this, maybe replacing P with P hat has no consequences whatsoever. And, um, you know, you should have a slight doubt about that. You should worry about that a little bit. And I'll, I'll try to say why in just a second. Um, for this week, right now, um, we want to estimate, or at least for this week, our goal is to estimate The sample mean for some um, for some population, a mean that characterizes some population, and the the formula that we use um, so x bar the the sample the sample mean um, estimates the population mean, x bar estimates mu 
But our formula for the family of intervals looks the same as the formula that we used before. So it's X bar minus a margin of error and then X bar plus a margin of error. But again, um, there's some conditions. And the conditions that you want, like A and B are kind of the same. Um, it's more or less the same as what's going on with the proportion. Like A, you know, the condition A that you're talking about, right? right here just sort of guarantees that there's nothing funny going on with, with the study. Like it's, it's not weird in some way that randomness really is playing a role. So the sort of tools that you're using sort of make sense. You can actually treat, you know, either P hat or X bar as being a random variable rather than something else. Um, the 10% condition, again, it's just, this is sort of a small data condition. Um, now for the mean, there's no real notion of a success failure condition, but the author, you know, discusses, um, the sample size. So the sample size in needs to be big enough to apply, you know, the central limit theorem. It kind of gives you a number, um, regardless of the nature of the population in over 30 is a pretty good bet. So, you know, when you're reading chapter 17, one of the important things to, to realize is the theorem that you're talking about, the central limit theorem is something that's not clearly spelled out, but Basically, um, if you're dealing with a population that has essentially any, in, any distribution you care to imagine, um, as long as the sample size is reasonably large, and by reasonably large here, we might mean more than 30, um, then the distribution of means is normally distributed with certain properties. So under those conditions, we might say that X bar is normally distributed with expected value, with mean mu, and with standard deviation sigma over root n, where mu is the population mean and where sigma is the population standard deviation. Now, it's, it's at this point in the chapter where the author kind of, kind of does some sort of bait and switch because all of a sudden, I think you're, you're not really dealing with the normal distribution. So basically what the, what the central limit theorem wants to say is it the picture for X bar? X bar is distribution, this nice bell-shaped curve, right? It's, it's a normal distribution in the centers over mu. Um, and, and the reason why the author kind of has to worry about this a little bit is that you don't, so I'll write this in capital letters, you don't often know sigma. You, you don't often know that. Um, and so basically you, you wanna replace sigma with S and you kind of see where you get. So what I'll, I'll sort of say a little bit more here, if you knew sigma, then the margin of error in cases like this would be kind of what you would expect from last week. It would be a, it would be a critical number multiplied by the standard deviation of the, the distribution for X bar. And so um, if you knew sigma, if you don't, then the margin of error in our formula, and I'll write it this way, it will be T, some other number, times S over the square root of N, where this guy right here comes from or derives from a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. So that, that is, 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 is an incredible, uh, these statements are, it's, it's weird to be, I, I guess what I'm saying is when you're reading the book, it's weird to be talking about this and then all of a sudden be talking about this when you, when you move right to the next section. And so um, when, you're, when you're thinking about this, what I would say is that that ought to kind of be troubling and it ought to be a little troubling relative to what you're actually seeing in chapter 16 as well. And, and that's because just like in chapter 16, two things are varying. So what we're saying in this case is our formula, you know, usually, um, our formula for the family ought to be X bar minus a margin of error and then X bar plus a margin of error and we're saying that the margin of error is, you know, some value of t 
times s over root n. Now, um, if you think about this for a minute, as the sample varies, both the center of the interval x bar and s vary. And so it's, it's a good deal like what happened last week when you were replacing p with p hat, except for some reason you don't mention this issue last week. So, um, you know, that ought, to, that ought to bother a student a little bit. I mean, that's, that's just an irritating detail. Like, why would you need to completely alter, alter the distribution in, in, in order to talk about this, but somehow you don't have to do that last week when you're talking about the population proportion estimates. Um, that's, that's worth thinking about. The author talks a, a little bit about that, but it's absolutely buried in one of the examples. So I'll talk, um, I'll talk about that example, but I don't want to talk about, I don't want to talk too much right now, mainly because, you know, probably talked enough. So, um, you know, this is sort of a, this is sort of a high level treatment. We did a couple of examples last time, which are related to coming up with the confidence interval. Um, I probably also mentioned that StatCrunch can be used to come up with a confidence interval more or less instantaneously. Um, so I'll pause right now. Does, any, does anyone have anything to ask? It's just an irritating, I mean, again, when you look at 17 and read that, you have to wonder about, you have to, you have to be suspicious, I guess, of what's, of what's in chapter 16, because it's a very similar sort of situation. You have to wonder a little bit about why you're worried about using the normal distribution in 17, but you have no such worries in 16. Um, I'll try to talk a little bit, a little bit about what, you would, what, what a practical remedy would look like to that, to that sort of irritation um, but I don't, I don't want to do it right now. Probably I will at the end of class, but before I move on, before we move into groups, does anyone have any questions to ask me right now about, about the conversation? The main thing is that we're trying to estimate either P or we're trying to estimate mu. Um, and in order to do that, we need to be able to say some things about the sampling distribution of the estimator. We have to talk about P hat or we have to talk about X bar. Um, the truth of the matter is that in order to talk about p hat, we will basically always talk about a normal distribution with regard to p hat. But when we're talking about x bar, the standardized means, this is the language the author wants to use, and it's a good language, the standardized means, um, when, you, when you write down the z scores, so to speak, associated to x bar, they're t distributed from, from any practical point of view if you don't know s. Um, so is this, is this okay so far? It's a lot. Anyone have any questions about this treatment so far? So you maybe have the idea, the idea about what's gonna happen. Um, I'd like to have the groups work on a couple things um, just to take a minute. I'm gonna introduce a new handout and it's on, um, I don't think you can see my screen right now. Um, it's okay. Um, so if you go, um, so let me bring up Blackboard and I'm gonna show you where it's at. I'll share the screen just one second after I get to the right page. Um, okay, so if you go under, so let me share the screen right now. If you go under classroom handouts, there's a second item now up there. So we've been talking about this one, I think, through the first couple of days. The second item is this introduction to NHST. So um, the, the, the NHST is called Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. Um, it's a framework that we use in order to identify when we feel like um, we have, say, some, in order to identify, I guess, what I would, what I would broadly call statistical significance. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Um, now, there's a document there. There's a handout called Hypothesis Test.x. Um, that's the one that, that I'm about to show you. Um, now, when we break into groups, there, there, there are a couple of things that I don't want, I don't want people to do. What I want people to do is basically, what I want the groups to do is basically to read the problem, just read it, and then think, think about B. So when this question is asking about um, conditions for inference, the, the bit in the parentheses are important. What do you need to believe in order to believe that the sampling distributions for, sampling distribution for X bar looks normal? What do you need to check? And, you, and use common sense here. To to convince yourself. That, you know, X bar is some normal distribution. You know, what kind of thing do you need to convince yourself? Think about that. 
Um, I don't want to calculate the value of the test statistic. Don't worry about that. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that, I think, in a few minutes. All I really want the groups to do, think about, think, read the question, think about B and maybe write a couple things down. All I really want people to do, the groups to do, is calculate. So let me see if I can get the number right from memory. Um, calculate a 99% confidence interval for the mean under these conditions. Like if you think it's reasonable, even if you don't, right? So calculate a 99% confidence interval. I think that's what, yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, good. Um, so does anyone, oops, 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 not a new share. Um, so does anyone have any questions about what the goal is? So don't do the problem as it's written right now. Look at the problem, think about whether or not, think about what you think about the sampling distribution. Raise any objections that you might feel are appropriate for this problem. And then come up with a 99% confidence interval. Use StatCrunch to do it or a calculator. I think you could probably use either one. Um, with calculator, it's gonna be a bit hard to come up with the critical number, but you know, StatCrunch makes that, makes that easy. Then we'll come back and we'll talk about the analysis. Um, let me put people, let me create rooms. I want 17 rooms. Seven rooms is enough. Um, I will open the rooms, it's about 128. Let's take about 10 minutes for people to process it, to really think a little bit about part B um, in, in light of the conversation. And then we'll, we'll meet again together about 138. We'll go through the analysis and I'll try to introduce some new material that's related to the problem as it's written. So how did it go? Um, so I'll bring up the handout. Um, if the groups were thinking about B, um, you know, I guess there's several things to, to consider. Um, do you think? Um, and I'd like to get input on this, but um, when you think about when you think about the conditions for inference, when you're thinking about what what kind of conditions we would need in order to convince ourselves that, that the sampling distribution of our X bar was approximately normal, do you, do you think those are reasonably satisfied in this example? Um, there are a few things which I think are kind of okay about this. Um, you know, you have, um, I mean, you certainly have. Um, I mean, you you certainly have 32, right? I mean, in oops too far down. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that the sample size is 32. So that's okay. Um, I guess if I was worried about this, a few things that I would worry about is, um, I would worry about sort of the following. Do we actually think the 32 jumps that we're talking about are a random sample of all jumps after the training program was initiated. I mean, it seems like it's just like the first 32. And I think that's a potential hazard here because when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about what's going on in this type of problem, when you're thinking about the tools, um, you have to be wary of, of non-random samples. Um, so essentially a series of 32 jumps over the course of a week you would call into, I think you would call into question, um, you know, whether or not um, that was even a random sample. It could be any reason why, I mean, it could be lots of different reasons why during that week the, the numbers would be different, which have nothing to do with the training program for one thing. It would be, it would be more like, uh, it would probably be better to look, to look at what happened over a period of many weeks and just take random measurements chosen from some set of weeks which followed the switch, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, and again, this is probably also related to the following concern. Um, do we even know that the jumps that week are independent? Um, so this is the sort of thing that can really that can really mess up the work. Um, these two things, I think, are more related to that first kind of condition. I wouldn't really be too worried about the 10% condition and N is 32, so maybe those things are okay. But um, it's, it's these things that would really bother me about this experiment. Um, does this make sense? That's what would bother me. Does, is there anything that bothers anyone else?
Okay, well, if not, good. Um, when you're calculating a confidence interval um, for, for the mean, um, I think that's maybe the next thing to do. So let me give myself a little space. I'll go up here. Um, notice that you can do that. Um, you're given a couple of pieces of information. Um, the sample mean that you get out of the 32 is 21.5 feet and the sample standard deviation is 1.26. Um, so if you wanted to calculate a 99% confidence interval by, by hand, um, you'd remember that the general formula we want looks like X bar minus a margin of error, X bar plus a margin of error. So that's our interval estimate. Um, we know what X bar is in this case. The actual, the actual value for X bar is 25.1. Um, as in the side, we also know that S is like 1.26. Yes. We'll need that later. Um, and the margin of error that we're gonna use in this case looks like um, S divided by the square root of N, N is equal to 32. So you get one point times, times T star, I guess, right? So you get 1.26 divided by the square root of 32 times whatever the critical number is. And because the confidence level is 99%, the critical number is something that you can compute using StatCrunch. So let's do that quickly. Um, if you go to StatCrunch, because you don't know the standard deviation of all possible jumps, you have to use a T distribution. So you go to stat calculators T. Um, again, it's a nice symmetric distribution, has a certain shape. Um, the number of degrees of freedom in an example like this, first you have to go in between to find the number, but the number of degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom in this example is one less than the sample size. So it should be 31. And um, you're looking for a 99% family. So you put 0.99 right there. And the cutoff you get is about 2.744. And so um, you sort of put all this together and you can get the, you can get the confidence interval. Um, so, you know, you can also do this very quickly on StatCrunch, but before, um, before, I, before I do that, before I subordinate the entire calculation to StatCrunch, I'll stop. Um, does anyone have any questions? Did anyone get anything different than those things? So it's okay. Um, if you wanna do this all at once on, on StatCrunch, you can more or less do the following. So let me hide this. Um, you don't need that. Um, go to stats and I guess we need, uh, we need T stat one sample with summary. Um, you can provide the sample mean, which if, if memory serves in this case is 25.1. The sample standard deviation is 1.26. The sample size is 32. Um, the confidence level you want is 0.99. Um, you hit compute and you'll get the upper and lower limits. Um, one nice thing to check is to, is to check to see whether or not the answers you get here conform to what you get by hand. Um, they should be pretty close based on some rounding decisions that you might make. Um, so basically you get this, you get you know, some standard error estimates. Um, a lower and upper limit, which is what we're after. Now, if you go back to the problem, one can one can sort of follow up and ask the question. Um, you know, the average the average prior to the program is twenty four point five feet. Um, if you look at what happens after the program is 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 initiated, um, you get an interval which looks like twenty four point four eight to about twenty five seven. So you can ask yourself, you know, in this particular situation, you know, do we think that the evidence points in the direction of the training program actually making a difference? If it did, you, you might guess that, you know, the number 24.5 wouldn't be in the interval at all. So, you know, you have a nice big interval. 
Um, but you feel like the evidence, at least at the confidence level of 99%, doesn't point to any major differences. That's because um, you know, tw you know, something around 24 and a half is in that interval. So um, it's an element of the interval. So you know, you can't really say, I guess, in this case, at least at the 99% level of confidence, that there's evidence that the program did anything. Another thing I think I'd point out is that if the confidence level was like 95%. Um, the confidence level, the confidence interval would shorten a bit. It would probably shorten to exclude 24.5. So in that case, you would have evidence at a different confidence level. And it sort of it suggests that, you know, you should be worried a little bit about how things like confidence levels are, se are selected um, because you wind up, you know, forming different beliefs about, uh, about evidence on the basis of different intervals. Do you have any questions about this so far? Anything at all. Um, so if, if you don't, um, I mean, I, I think in the sense we're done with at least this part of inference, um, there may be a little bit more to say about, about 17, but you can sort of explore that on, you know, both on the reading assignment and on the homework. So there's may, there may not be much more than I need to say. Um, so I guess with that in mind, I'd like to start thinking about chapter 18 um, to, to kind of get to kind of get ahead a little bit. Um, you know, to, uh, to get ahead of next week. So I'll write a few things down uh, kind of about what we're out to do um, and describe a little bit about, you know, one thing that the author writes about in chapter, chapter 17, which makes a difference, um, which might make a difference in your point of view um, about, about chapter 18. So in chapter 17, the author writes something like, um, something like this, writes something like X bar minus mu divided by um, S over root N, the standardized means, so I'll call this standardized X bar, um, writes that that is distributed, um, so I'll write it this way, is T distributed with N minus one degrees of freedom. Now going forward, the standardized statistics are the ones that we will tend to, that we will tend to look at, to look at when we do what comes next. Um, so it's a standardized statistic in the same way that you would have used things like Z-score formulas or look at standard scores in the earlier part of the course. Um, what's going on here is you're looking at X bar minus some sort of value from you divided by what you think of as being the standard deviation of the distribution, the sampling distribution for X bar or at least an estimate of it. Um, and so when, when you think about standardized X-bar, that's one of the things we'll wind up studying. Um, and in chapter 18, we make um, some additional assumptions. We make um, what amounts to um, a kind of, kind of modeling assumption. And I kind of want to give you an idea of what that might look like problems like these for problems of inference. So I'd like to call, uh, call back to your mind this, this question um, written assignment four. It's related to the coin, right? So this is not for means, but it's, it's for proportions. Now for this problem, remember that we can ask If the coin is fair, how extreme is something like p hat equal to 0 0.6? So this was actually a rephrasing of the problem that, um, that we were trying to get at in written assignment four. I mean, again, another way of asking this question is if the coin is fair, How do you feel about thirty heads out of fifty flips? So that was actually how the question was phrased at that time. We weren't talking about proportions, but we might as well have been. 
And people talked a lot about that. They, they wrote answers, I think, on that written assignment, which I think were kind of in a productive direction um, because many people's answers, most people's answers, I think, converge to kind of this type of response in order to feel anything at all. We need to say something about, we need to know how far 0.6 is from 0.5 in the right units. Units of the standard deviation. So, you know, whether or not people realized they were writing that or not, I'm not sure, but that, that was kind of the convergence of most people's answers and that was, that was productive. So what this suggests is, is the following. So just like we were talking about last week, we want to think about the proportion of heads as being something that, I mean, it's almost right, um, which is approximately normally distributed with mean equal to the actual true proportion of getting heads um, and then a standard error that looks a bit like this. So I want to treat it just like a problem involving a proportion. And you know, if you simulate using StatCrunch, the actual situation when P is equal to 0.5, you'll see that it's reasonable to do this. Um, so I want to treat P hat in this way, the proportion of heads. Um, and so if I want to know how far, so if P is equal to 0.5, how far, is 0.6 from 0.5 in standard units. So the answer to this is, is, uh, is the difference between 0.6 and 0.5 divided by the standard deviation of the distribution of the proportion of heads, which is whatever that number, whatever that number is, when P is equal to 0.5 and when N is 30. So it's whatever number you get coming from, coming from this calculation. Now we did this calculation at some point, um, or at least we did something equivalent to it. And the, the end result of the analysis, I think, and this is what most people's intuition really was anyway, is that this result is not terribly extreme. Um, but in any case, this is the kind of thing we want to measure. Um, so what you're looking at is a standardized statistic. It measures how far away something happens from something that is expected to happen under the modeling assumption that the coin is fair. And so that, that's some number, and you ask yourself, does that number that you get, does that standardized score represent some kind of extreme value? Um, do, do you think that the number is in any way unusual? So um, you can certainly do this calculation. Um, I don't know that I want to do it. I could do it, could do it on Excel pretty quickly. Maybe it's not that important to do it, but it's some number. Um, and so when we're doing what we're doing in chapter 18, we generally look at at either something that looks like p hat minus p divided by the square root of P times one minus P divided by N um, to explain P is some, is made, it's, it's a result of some modeling assumption, which you write down. And N is the sample size. Or we look at x bar minus mu divided by s over root n, where um, mu is a number. It's, it's the result of some modeling assumption, it comes from a modeling assumption. And n is the sample size. Now, again, just like with the inference we were doing with proportions, um, you sort of have to know that the sampling distribution is normal in order to sort of 
say whether or not you think the numbers that you're getting out of this are in any way reasonable. Um, just like what the author writes in chapter 17, this guy right here has a certain T distribution. Um, the author wants to treat this as a normal distribution um, with, with mean P and cert certain standard deviation that looks like this. So, um, you know, without those, without those beliefs about the sampling distribution, the techniques sort of fall apart. So there's always some, there should always be some effort to convince yourself that the sampling distribution for the statistic really is what you think it is. Um, now to go back to, to go back to the question as it's written, um, you know, so you have this, let me add a couple of, couple of pages. Um, if you wanted to treat this problem um, in the way that we're talking about right now, um, I, think, I think you would do it in the following way, or at least here's one way of doing it. So suppose that the, the mean is 24.5. 24, so somehow you know that the mean for this jumper is, is equal to 24.5. 24 you, believe, you believe that that's a reasonable number based on measurements you make. Um, do we think that an X bar equal to 25.1 with S equal to 1.26 is extreme? So in order to answer this question, I mean, I'll use the typical notation at the book that the text uses to, to sort of set up this problem. When you, when you were writing something like this, the modeling assumption that you're making, at least the way that I want to treat this problem right now, is that the null hypothesis is that the mean is 24.5 feet. Um, let's just say for the sake of the problem, the alternative hypothesis is that it isn't. So when you formulate things this way, what you're saying is that there's some sort of belief about, about uh, there's some sort of belief that you're asserting you think the mean really is 24, 24 point five feet, and if if that's true, you're trying to gauge whether or not something like this is unusual. If you think that something like this is unusual, um, then if you think it's extreme, then you would think that the that, that the act of this occurring, the, the the fact that that has occurred somehow, you would think that that would somehow cast doubt on the modeling assumption itself, and that's kind of that's kind of where we're headed. So when the author talks about null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in chapter 18, really it amounts to a modeling assumption. Sometimes that alternative is one-sided. Um, I don't wanna deal with that right now. In this case, I just wanna frame things this way with the basic modeling assumption we're making is that mu is equal to 24.5. And the alternative to that is everything else. Um, I'm trying to see if there's evidence against this belief, which would come from the fact that that happened. Um, so how do I classify this thing? How do I say if it's extreme or not? I look at the value of the standardized mean when mu is equal to 24.5. I see how far away that, that from that is. Um, so I measure this. Um, I guess n should be 32 if memory serves. So I look at that. Um, I already know that X bar is 25.1. I know that S is equal to 1.26. And so in this case, I get um, the value of and what, the, what the author calls the test statistic to be, you know, whatever 25.1 minus 24.5 divided by 1.26 over root 32 is. Um, so I'll approximate this in just a second. Um, let me stop for a moment. Does, does everyone more or less understand the framing of the conversation? We're trying to figure out how far away something is from some sort of, from some sort of expected result under the model. If we're assuming that mu is equal to 24.5 and if we believe that the sampling distribution has some basic set of characteristics, it's just a measurement. And so you get some sort of standardized score under the model. And in a way, that's what the value of the test statistic actually is. Um, we won't make a judgment about it yet, but at least that's where we're at. How do, people, how do people feel about this so far? It's not what we did the last couple of weeks. It's a little new, but it's just a measurement. And so when we wind up doing the calculation, let me bring up Excel real quick. It's probably the easiest way to do it. 
at least for me. Um, go back here. So when we wind up using Excel, um, you just type in, you can do this with a calculator as well. Um, you type in, I'll type in equals, um, you know, I can, it can do quickly, which is why I like it, 25.1 minus 24.5. That's the numerator of the so-called test statistic. I divide that by the quantity 1.26 over square root 32. Um, when I hit enter, um, I get something on the order of about 2.69. And so, um, let, me, let me just write that down. So the value of the test statistic is about 2.69. So what we're saying is that, you know, is that extreme? Do we consider that to be extreme? Um, and, you know, it and the answer is, we consider this extreme, is it far away from 24.5? And the answer is it depends. How do we define How do we define extreme? And so I think at this point, um, probably would be a good idea to go back and then read, give yourself a chance to read chapter 18. Um, extreme is usually defined via something called a significance level. Um, significance level is sometimes just a judgment call. Um, you know, some the typical levels of significance are 5%, 1%. Um, but when you see something like 1% or 5%, it's talking about a tail area. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more next week, I think, about how to make sense of the idea of something like that. But for now, I mean, you're basically talking about, in some rough sense, something that's about 2.7 standard deviations above, um, you know, you know 24.5. Would, would you consider that to be unusual? Well, you know, maybe. But there are a lot of question marks about this type of analysis, as we mentioned before, because you're not really sure if you're dealing with a random sample or not. I mean, that seems to be the major obstacle to understanding what's going on with this type of, this type of problem. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, I don't really want to say too much more about, um, about, uh, about confidence intervals. I think we talked about that. And I kind of want to leave the conversation about significance, significance testing right here, only to say that you know next week and for some of the weeks after that, it's really just a question about measuring at least with significance testing framework, it's, it's a question about deciding what's extreme and you know, do you think there's anything unusual going on um, which would cause you to doubt you know, a certain modeling decision that you made that would cause you to doubt the so-called null hypothesis as the author wants to write, it, write about it. Um, any questions about this? Okay. So if, if you don't have any questions about it, I think I'd probably want to wait to give people a chance to read the material, read chapter 18 a little bit. You may not have time to do that now. That's fine. Probably finishing the exam is more of a priority. Um, but we'll continue to talk about this next week. We'll do significance testing for both means and proportions more or less all at once. Um, but, the, uh, but I think that's, that's probably where I'd like to leave it for this week. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording.